I want to introduce our, um, uh, the other San Jose uh, City Council member who has been integral to this effort in, in, our, in our community. Uh, oh, by the way, my name is Paul Ledesma. I'm the uh, uh, trash reduction coordinator for the stormwater permit at the City of San Jose in the Environmental Services Department. Um, and I want to introduce Sam Licardo. Council member Sam Licardo was elected to the City of San Jose City Council uh, in November of 2006. Prior to his election, he served as a prosecutor at the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. Councilmember Licardo's commitment to the environment includes his advocacy for alternative transportation and mass transit, as well as his work banning San Jose's purchase of plastic water bottles. His leadership with that of Councilmember Chu to pass a single-use bag ordinance last December made San Jose the largest city in the United States to do so. Councilmember Licardo is the chair of the city's Transportation and Environment Committee. He often rides his bike to work and he relies on solar panels to power his home. Sam Licardo has a bachelor's degree in government and economics from Georgetown University, a law degree from Harvard, and a master's degree in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government. Please welcome Councilmember Sam Licardo. Thank you, Paul. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, I know that uh, I'm catching you probably just before the onset of food coma, so I'll try to, to make it fairly brief. Usually politicians like me don't have much useful to do, uh, but today I think I am your segue, uh, segue from plastic bags to polystyrene, uh, and uh, I appreciate the very generous introduction. Uh, as many of you all know, in San Jose, uh, we pushed hard on an effort and we were successful uh, to be able to ban uh, single-use pl bags, uh, plastic and paper, with the help of a lot of partners. I know I saw Felicia Madsen just a moment ago from Save the Bay. Uh, a lot of folks uh, helped in this effort. And I think you all know, because many of you have been working on these problems much longer than I have, uh, that this only happens with partnership. It's a lot of folks uh, involving a lot of interest groups, environmental groups on the outside that need to push and certainly uh, a very dedicated team of city staff. Uh, in our case, it was led by uh, Emmy Mendoza, who I think was here a minute ago. Yeah, she's around somewhere. Anyway, uh, folks who are, who are pushing hard in City Hall. And obviously, we do this uh, in, in a regional effort. We knew that Palo Alto had already taken uh, the leap, and that certainly made it easier for us. And we hope that our leap is making it easier for other communities nearby. I certainly wanted to thank the city of Cupertino for hosting uh, us in this event, and, and all the community partners have been a part of this. I think uh, certainly uh, City of Palo Alto as well, WMI, Clean Water Action, uh, the Water District, all the folks who have been partnering with us on these efforts. Of course, polystyrene is now the, <clears throat> the next frontier, and several cities already, again, uh, made that push. In San Jose, we are embarking on that effort now. Uh, we are going to be coming back to the Transportation Environment Committee in a few months with a trash reduction plan uh, that I'm hopeful will include a ban on uh, polystyrene use for food containers. Uh, certainly, we're already feeling the heat of opposition uh, as we were with the plastic bag and single-use bag effort. Um, I know that uh, the lobbyists are out there. They're working hard. Uh, that's okay. We're going to do this in collaboration with uh, the business community, we're going to get out there and do outreach, certainly uh, in our neighborhoods, and understand uh, how we can do this in a way with broad support in the community. And uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to get this over the goal line very, very soon. Um, I know that um, many of us are going to continue working on this together, and I'm sure our paths will, cro will cross. But don't hesitate uh, to contact our office if we can help direct you to the very smart people in the city of San Jose who are leading our effort. Uh, Melody Tovar, I know, is here and, and others as well. Uh, we, I, of course, know nothing, but I'm happy to, to direct <laughs> you to people who know something, and, and hopefully we can all accomplish great things together. Uh, so with that, thank you for being here, and your commitment and your time and, and energy is, is certainly uh, something that gives me great hope for our regional efforts here in, uh, in the Bay Area. Thank you.
Okay, on to our first speaker. Um, actually, it's a panel. <clears throat> no, it's first speaker, excuse me. Um, yeah, I'm right on top of it. Um, all right, I'm going to introduce a couple of folks who are going to come up here and, and, um, and give their presentations. Clay Regal oversees the City of Palo Alto Zero Waste efforts and is responsible for overall coordination with the city's zero waste programs and activities, including key elements of the city's zero waste operational plan. He has been involved in the waste and recycling field for over 15 years, working for both public and private sector. He specializes in public education and outreach, waste reduction and recycling and technical assistance, program management and business to business sales. Also presenting is Allison Chan from Save the Bay. Allison brings Save the Bay a background in marine and coastal policy and economics. Prior to joining Save the Bay, Allison worked for the Coastal Ocean Value Center at the Ocean Foundation, studying economic indicators and ecosystem health in three California estuaries. She has also worked for, in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, helping to conduct a survey of recreational boaters. Allison now works on Save the Bay's Clean Bay project, helping Bay Area cities pass ordinances that will prevent plastics prevent pollution in our creeks and waterways. She also clo works closely with Save the Bay's communications staff on the annual Trash Hotspots campaign. Allison earned a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and a minor in international relations from USC and has a master's degree in, from uh, UC Santa Barbara in environmental science and management. Please welcome Clay Regal and Allison Chan. Thank you. Let's bring up my presentation here. All right. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm so excited that Save the Bay was able to participate in this event. And uh, it's amazing to see such a huge group of people that uh, are interested in learning more about this together. So before you hear from uh, the panel that's coming up next uh, about uh, bands, uh, polystyrene bands around the Bay that are currently uh, being implemented or uh, on the road to implementation, I want to give you a short background on the issues um, that some of you may be very familiar with and others of you, um, this might be the first time you're learning some of it. So so I hope this is helpful to you, and I um, hope it gives you a, um, a, a good uh, foundation for discussing polystyrene. So uh, I know that when we think of plastic bags, you can really, you know, everyone knows what a plastic bag looks like. Um, but, uh, but polystyrene is a, a bit of a different uh, material, and there's a lot of confusion out there about what exactly polystyrene really is, and I certainly didn't know until I started diving into it myself. So um, polystyrene comes in a lot of different forms. It um, comes in one of the forms we're most familiar with, which is the po foam polystyrene. Um, one type of foam polystyrene is called uh, extruded or expanded polystyrene, EPS. So you, some of you might have seen that uh, abbreviation before. Um, and that's, you know, that's material that, material that makes up uh, food containers and packaging and so on. And then there's also rigid, which is also called oriented or clear polystyrene. That's a lot of your clamshells um, in terms of food service wear. Um, but then there's, there's a lot of other types, and those are all generally dependent upon how they were produced. So as you can see from my graphic here, uh, you know, it comes in a lot of different forms uh, and a lot of different products. I mean, things that I didn't know were made out of polystyrene, CD cases and um, uh, utensils and agricultural materials as well. So um, uh, that just gives you an idea of how vast the universe of polystyrene really is. And um, Save the Bay is really focused right now on polystyrene foodware, and I'll explain that a little more in a few minutes. So We've heard a lot today already about uh, the impacts of plastics on the environment, and so I won't go too much into it, but polystyrene, particularly polystyrene foam, um, it is really a threat to our creeks in the bay. And uh, everyone knows it's an eyesore, but um, it really does have serious uh, impacts. And even when it's properly disposed of, you know, you put it in the trash can, it's taken to the landfill, it's very easily transported uh, into our creeks and the bay. 
Um, and as a result, polystyrene foam is actually the second most abundant form of beach debris in California. And um, it's also a consistent item picked up by uh, volunteers on Coastal Cleanup Day and other uh, volunteer uh, cleanup events throughout the year. So it's something we see all the time. And uh, once it reaches our waterways, it, it really becomes a threat to our wetlands and wildlife. You saw a lot of the impacts to marine life already from Miriam Gordon's presentation. Um, but it also um, really impacts our wetlands. Our, our fragile wetland ecosystems really can't perform the ecosystem functions that they are meant to do when they're being suffocated by litter, particularly polystyrene foam, because it does not biodegrade ever. And uh, in addition to the need to address the environmental impacts of uh, polystyrene, it, um, it really is a litter item that has serious economic impacts as well. As you all know, uh, cities spend millions of dollars every year cleaning up litter. Uh, a lot of that is plastic pollution. And um, you know they, they're constantly engaging in activities, costly activities such as street sweeping and uh, maintaining stormwater conveyance systems and creek cleanups. And of course, creek cleanups are now part of what's being expected of cities under the, the regional stormwater permit. Uh, but despite all of these costly investments in, in time and effort to, to keep our waterways clean, um, our shorelines are still littered with these products. Um, and this really decreases their appeal to recreational users throughout the Bay Area, which as we know, are, there are tons of them, as well as tourists. And that ultimately impacts the local economy. So this really is a, a local economic issue as well as an environmental one. So why is Save the Bay focused on polystyrene foodware? Well, uh, the reason is because recycling is simply not an option, and of course, uh, due to the environmental impacts as well. Um, according to CalRecycle, there is no meaningful food service polystyrene recycling in the United States, and that obviously goes for the state of California as well. And uh, companies that claim to recycle this material uh, will only um, accept polystyrene foam for recycling if it's clean and free of food residue. And I'm not sure the last time you saw a polystyrene food container that was clean, but I don't think I've ever seen one. And um, virtually, there are virtually no recycling programs um, in the Bay Area that accept um, polystyrene foam in their curbside uh, in their curbside collections. So in order for any polystyrene recycling program to actually work, uh, what, we'd, what we would need uh, residents to do is to um, clean their takeout containers and uh, stockpile them until they've amassed enough that they feel like getting in the car, dumping it in their trunk, and driving it to the nearest facility that will accept it. Um, clearly, that is not a reasonable solution for residents. And uh, due to the, the weak market for the recycled material, it's not a sustainable solution either. So. So passing uh, polystyrene ordinances, luckily, is, is really becoming a regional trend. Um, many of you come from jurisdictions that have already uh, banned it or are looking into banning it. Um, out of the, the 40 that have, uh, over 40 that have been passed state, statewide, over half of those are in the Bay Area. So we're doing a good job. Um, there's still more work to be done, but we're definitely um, leading the way on that. And uh, the most recent Bay Area polystyrene foodware bans include um, the city of Palo Alto, the cities of Fremont and Hayward, and um, just a couple weeks ago, San Mateo County passed, passed a ban as well for the unincorporated area. And I, re uh, I recently spoke with a restaurant owner in the city of Millbrae, and um, he explained to me that um, he re actually receives very positive feedback from his customers. He owns two restaurants in the Millbrae, Millbrae in the city of Millbrae, and he receives really positive feedback for uh, switching to sustainable foodware and, and discontinuing the use of polystyrene foam in order to comply with, with their ordinance. And so um, that just is one example of how there really is a growing demand for green businesses, and this also goes for uh, businesses that eliminate plastic bag use as well and, and other single-use uh, materials. So, um, and, the, and the options on the market are really expanding um, in terms of the variety of products that are available as well as the quality. And one of the concerns that a lot of restaurants have had in the past is that these alternative products don't do well when it comes to hot items or liquids, you know, soups and things like that. And um, we're beginning to realize and see that there's a lot of options on the market that are, are good for that. And um, they're also becoming more affordable. This was discussed a little earlier on the panel uh, in, this morning, but um, uh, the, the options are becoming more affordable as, as um, time goes on. And actually, the, the city, excuse me, the county of San Mateo, in their uh, study uh, leading up to their ban, uh, uh, conducted research that came up with the fact that 
complying with a uh, polystyrene ban in the city would cost businesses as little as $150 a year. And um, those were businesses that were primarily using disposable foodware. So if um, restaurants are, are using more reusable foodware, it's going to be even less of an impact on them. So um, like I said, the costs are really going down and there are affordable options. And um, th this uh, same business owner in Millbrae also explained that restaurants generally have to raise their prices every year anyway due to inflation and other, other reasons. And so um, the cost of, of making that switch to, uh, to uh, uh, alternative foodware products um, really kind of goes unnoticed in, in terms of, of the reasonings behind uh, price increases. So I hope everyone in here is considering working on a polystyrene foodware ban. And uh, you know, we've, uh, we here at Save the Bay have learned a lot uh, from the cities that we have worked with that have moved forward with this. Um, and so um, I tried to distill down a few things that are important to consider um, for those of you who are going to move forward with this. Um, first of all, uh, the opposition is definitely going to argue, which they often do, that, um, uh, that uh, polystyrene foam is uh, a very small portion of the waste stream. And um, that's because they're looking primarily at weight and volume. But what the real issue here is with polystyrene foam food wear, uh, is the disproportionate impact it's having on our environment, on the creeks and, uh, and our wetlands. So framing the issue in that way, that, it, that it's a material that has this disproportionate impact, um, and that by, by getting rid of it, you're going to decrease the abundance of that particular type of litter in the environment is the way that we try to frame the issue. You'll also want to uh, think, obviously, about what materials you'd want to cover in an ordinance. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, foodware will be both foam uh, products as well as the rigid or clear polystyrene. Um, you're going to hear from the city of Millbrae uh, on the panel coming up next that um, their ordinance does address both types of uh, of foodware. Um, the County of San Mateo ordinance also addresses both types, so it's something you'll want to consider. Um, and you'll also want to think about other types of foodware aside from the clamshells and things like that. Um, a lot of ordinances don't address things like coffee cup lids or uh, utensils, um, and, but those are still uh, definitely a major part of the litter stream and waste stream, so you'll want to consider that as well. Of course, uh, as you all know, outreach is extremely important. Um, cities that we've worked with have approached this differently. Some have sent letters to their businesses. Some have held public meetings. You want to make sure you hold public meetings at times that restaurant owners can attend them. Um, others have actually you know, gone out to businesses to speak with them directly. And, and most cities do a combination of all of that. And so it's a bit of an investment of time, but the payoff is, is definitely huge when you have your businesses on board. And that's definitely something that um, councils are, are often looking out for. Have we brought in the businesses? Have we made sure that they're aware of what's going on? You'll also want to think about your demographic. Um, the city of San Jose, I believe, translated their materials into two or three different languages for their plastic bag ordinance. Um, I think that was really helpful, especially to um, certain areas of their community which is, which where primarily ethnic businesses. And um, you may want, even want to consider conducting some public meetings in another language as well. And that will make sure, help to make sure that you reach um, every aspect of your community. And then another really important thing to do is to communicate with your uh, recycler. Um, not all compostable foodware is made equal. Some composting facilities um, only accept specific types of compostable foodware. And so it's a conversation that you'll definitely want to engage in early on with uh, your composting facility to make sure you understand what they're going to accept so that you don't have your residents using compostable materials that actually end up into uh, the landfill. Uh, and also, the same goes for your recyclable materials. Just make sure you're, you're aware of all of those things. And um, another option that, that is great to let your businesses know about are, are purchasing co-ops. Uh, we have Greentown Los Altos here today. Um, we always sing their praises everywhere we go. And um, if you join their co-op, which is free, you automatically receive a, a discount on compostable foodware from the company they work with, World Centric. So that's just one option of many for um, helping businesses to comply with this ordinance and um, decrease the impact on them. 
So that really just scratches the surface on the types of issues that we often run into when we're working with cities. And um, what I think is going to be really helpful for you now is to um, hear this panel that's coming up of uh, cities who have actually Im implemented these ordinances. So I'm going to uh, pass it on to them. So thanks very much. Okay, I, I made an oversight. Uh, is Don Eggleston here? Sir, thank you. Um, this is Don Eggleston. He is the uh, head of the Sunnyvale Chamber of Commerce. We have business in, in the house as well, and I really want to underscore they are one of our partners, and we need to work with them, and I think all, that's a recurring theme that you're going to hear through all these presentations, and uh, so welcome, sir. Okay, Clay. Ladies and gentlemen, Clay Regal. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Okay, so next we're going to have a panel of uh, representatives from cities that have actually successfully implemented bans on expanded polystyrene food service products. So, you know, we have a wealth of information here in the room, and we wanted to get some people here uh, that can share some of the best practices, lessons learned on their experience and what worked. Uh, so those uh, folks that are looking at perhaps implementing uh, bans on EPS food service could, can learn from them. Uh, so I think we have the three of the panelists here, four panelists, thank you. Um, we have uh, Phil Bobel, who we heard speak earlier. He's the Environmental Compliance Manager and Acting Assistant Director of Public Works for Palo Alto. Come on, come on up when I read your name. Uh, Shelly Ryder, who's the in Environmental Programs Manager for the uh, City of Millbrae. We have uh, Ken Pianen, who's the Solid Waste Manager from the City of Fremont. And we have Jennifer Lee, who's the Sustainability Associate from the City of Richmond. So the way this is going to work is uh, I have a series of questions that I will pose to each of the panelists. Uh, we'll just go down the row here. Are there and right answers on these? Or no, see, this is good. I get to ask questions and not answer them for once. Right. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, if you can keep your responses to three or four minutes. Um, but I have basically the questions are just to generate some discussion points uh, for the experience that each of the cities here had in implementing their bans. Um, so the first question is, if you could discuss how you built a factual uh, business case for pursuing a polystyrene ordinance. Um, if you could talk, if you could, about what products you chose to focus on, how you dealt with the uh, CEQA applicability issue, and uh, what resources you used that provided you with reliable, factual information that you could use to present your case for a ban. So if we could start with Ken. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in the city of Fremont, um, I'm not sure if we've successfully implemented a polystyrene ban. We've implemented one that's been in effect for about six weeks. but. <laughs> Um, it, it looks like there's uh, strong acceptance by the community, and this was an issue we looked at in 2008 and revisited last year. Um, we, we had a very, um, a very well, well-meaning council member that was looking to um, perhaps leave a legacy as he was moving on to higher political office, so it made it very easy for this issue to come before the community. Um, the, the ban that we've implemented in Fremont is on expanded polystyrene uh, products only. Um, we did that because our processor in Fremont is successfully recycling the rigid containers, and we felt that the foamed products were the most problematic from uh, the solid waste perspective and the difficulty recycling, as well as a, a litter problem as far as stormwater pollution. Um, we were also trying to be, as we developed this ordinance, we were looking to be uh, fairly consistent with what was already being developed by the other communities. So fortunately, we were able to draw upon several existing ordinances, kind of pick and choose what, what was going to be most effective in our community. There were some good definitions, there were some good enforcement guidelines, and we looked around at what was out there. So I would recommend that, of course, jurisdictions contemplating this do the same thing. Mm -hmm. As far as the environmental analysis, we, we had our own planning department develop in-house uh, a negative declaration, and that pretty much took care of our CEQA requirements. Okay, thank you. Phil? 
Oh, well, you've heard my story. We thought we had a successful thing until I stumbled into that store on Saturday night. And uh, <laughs> no, but that's just one out of hundreds. So, you know, um, pretty much the same. It's uh, ours just applies to the expanded polystyrene. We flirted with the idea of going further and didn't feel that there was really a scientific justification to distinguish between the rigid polystyrene and all the other kinds of plastic that's out there. And I'm happy to be shown that there is good uh, reason to um, pick on the rigid polystyrene, but we didn't, at that point in time, and it was almost two years ago when we started our process, didn't feel we had the evidence to go beyond the expanded. <clears throat> and the expanded is the stuff that breaks apart so easily. And it just from an environmental standpoint and kind of a common sense standpoint, we thought we were picking off the worst of the stuff, even though the rest of the plastic products aren't our favorite. We thought we'd start with the, frankly, the easy target. The other thing we kind of flirted with was the thing Miriam brought up before, was should we, <clears throat> um, specify a product or at least a type of product, namely compostable. Should we say that the uh, alternative product to be used would have to be compostable? Clearly, we kind of wanted to move in that direction. The problem that we had in Palo Alto, we're not as advanced in that area as some other places. We don't actually have a um, pickup uh, curbside pickup of compostables at residential. At that time, we didn't even have it for commercial. Now we have it for commercial. That is, we're picking up kitchen compostable waste for commercial, but we're still not doing it for residential. And <clears throat> so we thought, okay, it'd be good if this ban dovetailed and made sense in terms of our own pickup program, and we're not quite ready to force everybody to go to compostable because we're not actually composting residential stuff. So that to me was <clears throat> uh, pretty good logic. I don't know if you want to call it science, but it was pretty good logic for <clears throat> stopping where we did and, and just choosing the expanded and not specifying. We did specify, I think we specified it has to be recyclable. We went back and forth on that, but <clears throat> Um, you know, because we're now in, in our blue containers, as with most communities, we're taking all types of plastic in that blue container. Everything's recyclable, right? Well, is it really? I, you know, is it really getting recycled? Well, at least it's going in the blue container. At least it's not going in the landfill immediately. And so um, we felt kind of good about the drawing the line where we did. So. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, the City of Millbrae's Sustainable Food Service Ware Ordinance went into effect in January of 2008, and we started the planning a good year prior to that. And what our ordinance does is prohibit the use of polystyrene foodware and requires the use of uh, compostable, reusable, and recyclable foodware. It includes utensils. It includes both types of polystyrene, and I have lots of good arguments okay. why right. you should um, um, <clears throat> uh, look at both when you're doing the ordinance. And so how we devised ours is that we worked with our hauler, the South San Francisco Scavenger Company, in developing this because it made the most amount of sense to look at what they said they could collect as recycling. So we sat down at the table and talked about every type of plastic, what they realistically would pull from the line. And so our ordinance does allow certain types of plastic, primarily for the food where it will be in a number one type of plastic or number five, and that opens a, a big window for, for the restaurants and, and food vendors. And so it was really clear that they would not sort any type of utensils. Most of the utensils are polystyrene, so it requires that the utensils are um, compostable. However, that's probably the sticky point. With, not the sticky point in our ordinance, it's probably the one that's most overlooked, whether it's intentional or not intentional, but you'll go to the restaurants and you will see some polystyrene utensils. Um, next to never any styrofoam, but we'll hear about it here and there, but very rarely at, at this point. And so um, at this point, we still do exempt the hot um, cup lids because at the time when we were developing our ordinance, we did not 
feel that there was a suitable hot lid cup. And we tried them. We wanted to be fair to our businesses. And so it does include the cold cups, but we still, to this day, and maybe uh, one of the vendors out here will, will, find, will have an adequate one, but we didn't feel there was one and that we could realistically require that of our food vendors. This ordinance does apply to all food service where vendors, which is um, cafes, coffee shops, even Safeway, anyone that prepares and serves food on site or, or for takeout, and it applies to city facilities and for events as well. <laughs> So I really feel it's it's one of the more comprehensive ones out there because it does look at all materials and we couldn't really distinguish. I guess we really feel all polystyrene is bad. It's fair enough to say. <laughs> um, and that um, when you look at the manufacturing process and the toxicity, we just couldn't say, well, gee, we should allow that. When you look at the whole package of what polystyrene is, but we can talk more over beer in a biodegradable cup or something about that. <laughs> Uh, hi. So, um, in the city of Richmond, our ordinance went into effect this past August, and we'd been working on it for a while. So, we really started the first uh, staff report we had the first time we took this to council was in April 2009, and we went to council uh, three or four more times until it was passed in January 2010. And so, when I started with this, I was an energetic intern and really built a really long staff report based on a lot of factual information from Save the Bay, Clean Water Action, um, our stormwater program manager, and the coastal cleanup. And we had, you know, like a 13 page staff report or something like that. And um, when we got there, city council was, I mean, it, it wasn't hard to make the case that styrofoam was a problem in our city. Um, Richmond has 32 miles of shoreline and we've been doing these coastal cleanups and it's you know, consistently one of the main things that um, are brought up. Uh, when we went there with all this information, they were like, okay, what does the community say about this? Have you talked to anybody? And at that point, we had only done kind of the background um, why styrofoam is a problem. So we went back and did that for a few more months. Um, when we developed the ordinance, so, um, the approach we took, we, we made the ordinance as close to what a model ordinance would, um, we would like it to look like. So we included um, utensils and um, uh, rigid and expanded polystyrene, but when we went out and we started to do um, a lot of the outreach and now sort of the enforcement, we took a more soft line. And we saw that about you know upwards of 80% of our restaurants were using um, styrofoam and to get them to switch over, even if they're using um, the rigid type, we're still pretty happy with that because we think that for now that's um, a good step in the right direction. And for us, we were trying to build like a more nurturing relationship with our businesses. So bottom line is we have an ordinance that is written one way that we can adjust and do um, other phases of outreach to incorporate different things. but. Um, in the initial phases, we were just um, looking at styrofoam in the implementation. Um, as far as, let's see, CEQA goes, we just did an exemption. We didn't see any problem with that here. Um, now we're working on single-use bags, which is a different story. Um, <laughs> one other thing that we addressed as far as the factual case, so um, our council members were really concerned about the impact on businesses in our city. Um, we had community meetings, and we went out and we did our own um, price comparison. So in our first staff report, we did kind of general online, looked at a few stores, and then we went back in the next few rounds and looked at where um, our businesses were going for their products and kind of looking at percentage um, increase and what it would cost them to switch over and, and creating some hypotheticals that we could take back to council. And I think seeing that those prices were going down over time um, really made the case for us. Great, thank you. So the next question is, um, what steps did you take to reach out to the business community prior to the ordinance being passed? So uh, how did you do outreach? How did you get buy-in uh, from the business community prior to presenting an ordinance to your city councils? Okay. I know in the city of Fremont, when we, we first brought this issue up in 2008, we had prepared to do a couple of very interesting workshops uh, where we had set up 30 laptops and in a public meeting room and it would, you'd be able to answer questions and respond, it would be anonymous and the, the trends would populate up on the screen. And we had done one for plastic bags and had limited turnout. We had no RSVPs from restaurants for the styrofoam and we sent the consultant home and nobody showed up for the meeting. So um, that, that was a very difficult um, start because we were trying to solicit the input from businesses and they weren't interested in sharing it, apparently. So um, we, we began working with the Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, and uh, that, that was something that was, I think, really beneficial in our process because once we had their buy-in, um, I, I think council was much more comfortable moving forward. We knew we had some additional out, outlets for outreach and, and contacts. Um, but for the most part, we, you know, we started to, um, I think our primary piece was sending out uh, a mailer that said, you know, um, you know, the ordinance will be going into effect. Uh, there was a lot of press coverage when it was first discussed, two readings of a public ordinance, and again, nobody really came to speak in opposition to it. Um, the direct face-to-face -face contacts that, that I had and our, our staff had tended to reveal that businesses were ready for this. A couple of points that they made is they just wanted some time to use up their inventory so they didn't get stuck with a lot of stuff uh, that would put them out of compliance. And they, they also just wanted to make sure that if it, if it applied, it applied to every restaurant and every cafeteria, that they didn't want exceptions. They felt that put, would put them on, on equal footing. Um, another good outreach tool that we used is we, we utilize our sanitary district for restaurant inspections for stormwater compliance, and they began distributing an outreach piece every time they were doing a restaurant inspection. Uh, in case I don't get to mention this later, we're also using them for some enforcement and at least notifying the city if they make an observation of somebody using styrofoam, they'll contact the city on a regular basis and let us know that we've got some outreach, we've got to follow up and get out and uh, help a business find an alternative and reinforce the, the importance of the ordinance and that business coming into compliance. So Palo Alto, not much to add. I think I mentioned or Karin did earlier that we, as far as outreach, once adopted, we went to 80% within a few weeks, we went to 80% of the restaurants and food service facilities. And um, before it was adopted, we made one kind of similar attempt to have a meeting um, we knew what to expect there because from time to time we try to get our restaurants to attend meetings. It's very hard. Uh, we did have half a dozen or so uh, and no serious objections. I just wanted to hear what we were up to. So I, I would say we really had no real opposition except what I mentioned before, which was <clears throat> the uh, motels and some other strange people that had gotten wind of this were worried about those styrofoam cups, uh, which it does apply to at their uh, businesses for coffee. So with that exception, there really wasn't any pushback. I think we had three uh, mailers that went out uh, immediately before and then after to all the food service facilities telling them about it and um, there really wasn't much pushback. The one thing I wanted to add that I didn't from the, your first question, Mr. Regal, was um, <clears throat> about the CEQA situation. There is a difference there because um, Palo Alto, we had just been through the bag thing, and that was a lot more controversial. And so the decision we made <clears throat> was to do a mitigated negative declaration um, like we had done on bags. And it was primarily because we wanted to be, um, uh, they were similar enough in their in the type of action that, that everyone in our city, especially our attorneys, felt that that was good coverage for us, that there was good logic there, and we didn't have great logic of why we did this on plastic bags and why we didn't do it, why we wouldn't do it on, um, so we did do that, but the primary difference is that we had just done, just done bags. And I think the fact that we had just done the bag thing um, some months earlier, maybe a year earlier, it also was a reason that the, um, maybe that the pushback was a little less. Everybody was worn out on this whole plastic issue. <laughs> <issue. clears throat> um, <clears throat> tagging on to Phil, I also didn't address the, <clears throat> the CEQA element. And we did file a negative declaration based on no significant findings. Actually, um, 
found a, a copy of that and um, ran that down to the county office the next day literally and then just counted the calendar for 30 d days and was really relieved because we had that you know window of time where the city could be sued so we we did the same with a negative declaration as far as outreach and with the businesses I think there were two things that really made for the success for of our sustainable food service wear ordinance one was teaming up right at the beginning with our with the executive director of the chamber of Commerce in Millbrae, he got right on board. And part of it, it might have been, I mean, he knew the city was really serious about it and it could be the attitude, um, better to join them than beat them or, <laughs> or something like that, but they were really wonderful to work with. And, and the other success was the, the level of outreach we did with our businesses. If you know Millbrae, it's a pretty small community. It's easy to be hands-on and to talk with the businesses. So with the chamber, the first thing that um, the director did, John Ford, was call a meeting. He thought, well, let's just see you know, how people feel about it. So he did some outreach. It was real last minute, and we met at one of the local businesses. And this was really early on in the process. And so, um, there, like I said, there were just a few businesses. We talked about it. We talked about the different options that the city council could adopt for an ordinance, because there are various options. and. Um, and it went pretty well. I mean, there was some hesitancy and then talking about the cost, but it was interesting because there was one person there and, um, and there's this woman saying, oh, you know, we have this friend who's going to open a coffee shop here in Millbrae. And then she went on to espouse all the wonderful virtues of polystyrene and especially the styrofoam cup. And I was like, wow, you know, why is she so attached to it? <laughs> and it, I, it dawned on me later that it probably was someone from the American Chemistry Council. Um, so that was interesting. And so um, from there, we actually um, held another informational meeting, did a lot of outreach, sent postcards. I even went door to door. And it's just like what Ken said, you know, we called a party and no one came. <laughs> and I mean, we had someone from the media and someone from the hauling company, and there were more of us, but no businesses. And Millbury being small, it's a lot of mom and pop shops, and they're running their business. And one thing I realized, because I even went around and handed out flyers, just because you want everyone to know this is a big thing, and we wanted them to be a part of that process and be informed. And one of the businesses said, well, um, that you know they probably won't attend the meeting, but just let us know when it passes, and we'll we'll change our our foodware. So it just made me think that that was the attitude that people were willing. We really didn't have any opposition. And the one good thing about teaming up with the chamber is that the businesses felt comfortable talking with them. Um, they didn't want to whine to the city. They. Um, which was surprising, <laughs> but they did talk more with the chamber and it gave them that conduit to say, well, we're worried about this and about the cost, but there were only a few businesses that did that. And we did, um, in addition, a whole lot of outreach. We realized that no one would come to really meetings, so we did a lot of mailings. We did postcard mailings. This is what the city is thinking about. We did a mailer um, that, you know, there's going to be this meeting. We did one. This ordinance is going to go into effect. And I brought some handouts of, of all of our things and all of this is on our website as well, all of our outreach. And, and then we did one, oh, it is in effect, and then a reminder. I mean, seriously, you, you just couldn't not know that we had this ordinance in place. We did so much outreach. But I felt really good about that because everything went really smoothly. And like I said, it helped to have the chamber and it helped to do the level of outreach. We sent everyone a packet of materials. Thanks to Emeryville, we had adapted their um, fact sheet. Um, I know some of us being recyclers in the room, we hate reinventing the wheel, so we borrow and, and um, adapt it. San Francisco, we borrowed the foodware distributors list and updated the list of acceptable products. And then a letter from our director of public works that clearly outlined what the ordinance was, what it included, what it disallowed. And we also had that in, in Chinese, which is a dominant um, language and culture with, within our community. So. Um, it was basically we did as, as much as I think we possibly could and it did go smoothly. Um, there was a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, we did a survey after the, like, after the 
ordinance was in effect for about a year to see what people, what they used previously and what they were currently using. Not that many people responded, but we got some. And the other thing I wanted to mention, and I was talking with Emmy earlier about that, is that we also work with new business license applicants. And if you don't, if you don't do that, it's a really good um, outreach to be able to talk with them firsthand. They circulate to the different departments. There's a checklist. So we meet with them and talk about uh, recycling, a little bit about water conservation. And so it gives us the opportunity to give them this packet, point them to our website as well. And then, like Emmy had mentioned, it was good to hear another city do this. We call it our Sustainable Food Service Ware Acknowledgement Form, and she called it the self um, business certification form, but we do the same kind of thing. It really bullet points. We took it from our debris box ordinance. Uh, debris box, yeah, it is an ordinance because we have issues with that because we have an exclusive franchise, but that's another story. So we took that form and we adapted it to an uh, acknowledgement form that businesses, it could outline what the ordinance was about, and then they signed it. So down the road, when they squeeze in any type of polystyrene, we can say, you know, you signed this that you knew about it. So anyway, that's a good tool to be able to talk to businesses right from the onset as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, yeah, I brought some samples of our brochures too. So I'll actually, I'll throw that here. Um, so. Yeah, we also had, um, we, we sent out mailers and we hosted a couple of informational meetings. Not a lot of people attended, so after that we kind of changed our strategy and started doing door-to-door. -door. So um, within the, the few months before the ordinance went into effect, we visited um, upwards of 30% of businesses. It was really helpful to go there with sample containers, just bags of samples that um, we could show them what's, what um, they could use to be in compliance and also some samples that they could just keep because they didn't want to go and buy um, you know, a huge package of product not knowing if it would work for their um, hot products or not. And um, yeah, the response was varied. Um, some businesses, some of the owners, you walk in and they're like, well, what did I do wrong? And um, others are really thankful that, that you know, cities are making um, the effort to go and see businesses one-to-one. -one. Um, now, working on um, uh, plastic bags, I'm kind of comparing the outreach strategies and I'm seeing that as far as community engagement goes, it's a lot more successful. Um, so now we, we, what we did to start the plastic bag outreach is just kind of line up all the people that we want to talk to, the Chamber of Commerce, the business associations, um, and um, different retail groups, um, merchants associations, and we go out to where they are instead of bringing them to the city. If I have a survey, if I'm asking for information, I just bring it in hand. If it's online, um, I'll just print out copies and take it and have them fill it out on the spot, which is um, a lot more helpful, I think. Um, and what else? Um, it was really helpful to have um, different pieces of information in, so we did um, Spanish and Chinese mailers um, and our um, staff, we could cover those languages when we went out and I think people were really appreciative of that. Um, we had involved the Chamber at first. We had um, some meetings with Chamber of Commerce members. Um, they, did, they decided not to take a position on the, um, on the styrofoam. Um, um, ordinance, um, but we got access to a lot of people that wouldn't come to our informational meetings. Um, and this time around with plastic bags, they're considering it as maybe a business opportunity, which I think is um, something to be considered. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what information did your city council request um, so what did they what did they want to see? What did they find most helpful or most compelling when you brought forward your ordinance? As I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, the idea came forward uh, for the city of Fremont by uh, our council member Bob Wykowski. So um, when, as staff got got organized, you know, to to f create an ordinance, the, these are a few things that our council was sensitive to. They wanted to make sure that city facilities were also included so that we were, you know, essentially walking the talk. And Fremont has a very robust parks and recreation department with some teen centers and community centers, a senior center that are available to the, to the public to rent and use these facilities. So we had to work with our parks and rec department to make sure that those rental agreements were very clear that if you want to use the teen center, for example, that you complied with this ordinance. So uh, that, that became built in. Um, uh, 
I mentioned earlier about um, allowing businesses a chance to utilize their existing stock. So they were sensitive that there was adequate notice. In Fremont's case, we had about a six-month lead time, and we deemed that that was adequate to use up existing inventories. Um, council was concerned about having some, some language about hardship, uh, some, some hardship allowance that would either be <coughs> for cost or for the efficacy of a particular product. Um, it's, it's not something we're gonna cave in very lightly on as staff. I know that the city manager has the authority, but he'll likely designate you know, the decision and, and take the lead from environmental services staff. So we, we built that into the ordinance, although we know that there's good alternatives for just about um, everything. And cost really um, won't be a huge factor. Cost was something that council was sensitive to, it appeared, but there wasn't a lot of very good information about specifically what transitioning to either compostable or recyclable alternatives would be. You know, the higher end restaurants didn't mind getting something that really looked like it was high quality and durable, so they'd spend the additional, you know, 25 cents per piece if necessary. But most businesses for a very simple clamshell would, would see an incremental cost of a few cents per container, maybe five or 10 cents, 20 cents, 25 cents per meal. Those were some numbers that seemed to be thrown out. Um, and it seemed like they were willing to um, go with that, let consumers pick up the cost. And over time with uh, more products being available, those costs would likely come down. So that turned out not to be as big a factor as I thought and as staff, since we couldn't really get our arms around that very succinctly, um, we didn't bring forward a lot of detailed analysis and it, it wasn't requested. Um, I, another thing that I think that uh, council was concerned about was having some consistency uh, with other existing ordinances and models. We, we wanted to be, um, you know, like the other cities that had done this. We weren't looking to break new ground. As I said, we got to take advantage of the, the models and ordinances and the outreach pieces that were already out there. Um, there was also a interest in having the Chamber of Commerce support. Um, so, so we had established that and they, they spoke in support of the ordinance at our council meeting. Um, one other point that I want to make, there were some other, um, other groups that came and spoke in support, but as, as city staff people that will be bringing forward a new ordinance in your communities, I think it's really important to, to synchronize with the people that are there supporting um, your, your particular ordinance. That'll take some, some effort up front, but um, you don't want to be in a position where you're bringing forward something, it's a happy day, everyone's ready to high five each other up at the city council bench. But you, you, have, you have a speaker that gives the impression that your ordinance has come up short somehow. I mentioned Fremont had banned only foam polystyrene, but some of the, you know, the, the, there's a philosophy that polystyrene in any form is poison and that you shouldn't be you shouldn't be allowing that to be used in your community. Um, since, you know, we only banned foam polystyrene, when I heard uh, a supporter going on about all polystyrene, it seemed to be undermine the efforts that we had, we had done. We also allowed compostable materials, and there was some concern by a supporter that this could contaminate the plastic stream, and there was, it was a little bit convoluted, in my opinion, about, you know, are, are they really supporting or are they there with some degree of criticism? And that's not what we were really striving for. So I would encourage everybody, work up front, get on the same page. We needed the support. We appreciated having speakers um, speaking in, in support of our ordinance. Um, I think that could have gone uh, and flowed a little bit better in, in this public forum. So I would encourage everybody to get that sorted out in advance. Palo Alto, our council, I think it was, is there a problem? Yes, show the pictures of styrofoam in the creek. Um, uh, can it be recycled? No. 
Um, is there, um, are, are, are there good alternatives? Yes, 40% of our people have already switched. Whole Foods was our spiritual leader. There is no problem with the alternatives. Um, okay, boom, you know. It was, it was uh, and is there any a substantial opposition by the time it came to our council? No, so I just, it just wasn't a big deal. <clears throat> okay. Um, um, in, in Millbrae, um, the idea first came about from a former council member, Mark Hirschman, and he was really supportive of us moving forward with an ordinance. And we also had the support of the city manager at that time. So it really gave us a lot of energy to go out there. And I want to recognize um, Krista Kuhnhackel. Raise your hand, Krista. Because <laughs> she helped. She works with me in Millbrae, and she helped to craft the ordinance, looking at the ones out there. We were looking at San Francisco and Oakland, Emeryville, and Santa Monica at the time. And way back in 2007, when we were doing this, there really weren't um, many communities um, that had the, these types of or this type of ordinance in place. And we were the first in San Mateo County. And that actually um, gave us the ability to be under the radar. I think we took the American Chemistry Council by surprise because they came in at the 11th hour and, um, and had all these complaints and this and that. And it was just um, a little late. So we were lucky in that sense. And since then, there have been some other communities in the county that have adopted our ordinance, South San Francisco, San Bruno, and San Mateo County was um, mentioned earlier, first for their facilities and now for the unincorporated. And so, um, with this council support, um, we basically pulled together a whole variety of options that the city council could look at. And so we did two informational reports, one in June of that year, <clears throat> and then in September, really outlining all the options. It's basically, we told them everything you ever wanted to know about polystyrene food service wear containers and left no stone unturned. And we had, um, in the report included everything from the types of polystyrene, the difficulty in recycling it, um, the types of alternative containers out there, the costs, um, business outreach, timeline, just basically every facet. And quite honestly, what we really expected um, at any of those meetings and when we finally went to the council and it was adopted in, in, that, in um, I think it was October, was what our colleague Derek <laughs> experienced in Vallejo. We just thought we're gonna get either of these questions or we're gonna have all these groups and nothing. <laughs> it was it was really pretty amazing and part of it is because we did our homework and we spent a good year gathering all the information the findings and we didn't rush it and so I think that really worked in our favor by putting everything together and having what I think is a really solid ordinance and um, it seems like I guess Millbury is the only one on this panel that that prohibits both types of, of polystyrene so it's really comprehensive in, in that sense so um, and also, um, one thing that came from that and which was amazing during this process, because we did work with the businesses and showed the um, alternative food where did show and tell at the council meeting, but it was really surprising, like we would get knocks on the door just about every other day from all the entrepreneurs that were emerging in um, alternative food where. So it was really amazing. They're just, it's um, now so much more is on the market now and it's been tested in a lot of our businesses. We can see them switching and trying different types of, of containers and um, encourage them to work with each other. We have a lot of Chinese restaurants. We're like, well, talk to so-and-so and, and see what works for them. So that was interesting, all the different things that came out of developing and crafting this ordinance. But as far as with our city council, they're just, everyone was on board. It was just, um, it was a miracle. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, for us, not everybody was in bo on board to begin with. Um, we had at least um, three of our council members that um, kind of reprimanded us a little bit at first for coming with just the technical piece and not having done a lot of the community engagement. So we went back and, and talked to um, a lot of people for that. Um, they were interested in the cost factor for businesses and um, also how much time we were giving to businesses to comply, um, to use up their stock. So we really went out and we talked to people and assessed that and were able to come back with a good report. Um, of what community members were saying to us. And so the approach we took was to have um, at least what we thought was going to be a more stringent um, ordinance on paper with an extended um, time of compliance. So we really pushed that out and did the time to do um, the education. And even with 
um, the effective date, we built in a lot of things so that um, the very, very last resort would be any type of a fine. So we had um, a documentation of intent to comply, and we really worked closely with our code enforcement um, division to see what processes they have for administrative citation. So there was a 60, um, 90 day intent to comply. And until now, we haven't um, written out any citations because um, if people, if, if we see people still using styrofoam, we'll um, still, you know, kind of work them through that and we're going to start enforcing um, soon, but um, we really took that into consideration that council wanted us to really work with community members. Um, another thing that they were really interested in was seeing that this was consistent with um, other environmental initiatives that were coming out of our division. So one of the things that came up was, um, what are we doing with um, these new um, compostable containers? Um, do we have a solid waste program for that? Um, we really jumped on that opportunity and attached one of our second or third um, staff reports to a resolution supporting food waste composting. Um, that happened to coincide really well because our green waste contract was up, so we um, implemented f residential food scrap composting posting about the same time that the food bar ordinance went into effect. So it was really good to maximize on those um, opportunities. Um, the only other thing is that I think there was kind of a perception that um, switching over to compostable, um, recyclable containers would mean using the really like fancy innovative type stuff. and. Um, showing really the cost comparison and the different products that could be used, um, just like paper plates instead of styrofoam plates and aluminum foil covering that could be rinsed and recycled. Um, showing that to council and also taking those samples to businesses as low cost um, alternatives, like you don't have to use the corn based stuff that's still kind of clear and um, is really hard for our um, composting processor to process anyway. Um, so I think that kind of helped um, defray a lot of the misconceptions that this was gonna be a huge cost to businesses. Great, thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question. Can you tell us how many restaurants or food service establishments are affected by your respective bans? In Fremont, we have about 450. Okay. I think we say 300. Oh, 300. I think 100, give or take. We have a little less than 300. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience, so if I uh, call on you if you could wait to get the microphone so we can all hear, that would be great. Uh, I think go over here in the middle. Hi, Liz with the City of San Leandro. So I was wondering how much it cost to implement, whether it was outreach, legal, I mean, how much do you think you had to budget for this outreach? I mean, a lot of cities that want to do this, they have to consider that with such low budgets now. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, um, the staff time to develop the um, environmental document was um, a fairly small cost. Our outreach effort, you know, consisted of mailing the 450 pieces. Where Fremont will see its biggest costs is in the in in the contract that we have um, with our the Union Sanitary District, and they're responsible for doing restaurant inspections now for stormwater compliance. They've estimated about an additional 15 minutes per inspection where they'll look around, they'll make sure they, they hand out some outreach material on the ban, and if necessary, they'll, they'll look around the facility, they'll, they'll look for signs of styrofoam, and uh, report that back to the city. And that would, it's probably gonna increase that contract by about $25,000 per year um, for that additional time. Yeah, we never uh, did an estimate um, of the staff time. It was just staff time. You know, we didn't hire consultants to do things. Um, so, you know, maybe we've spent uh, half a person year on this over a period of a couple of years. Uh, I would say we spent nowhere near the amount of time on this that we spent on the bag thing, if you want to point a comparison. <laughs> you know, that we spent a ton of time on. But this was uh, much smaller, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think we have a, an exact cost. I mean, there was the staff time up front, maybe quarter time, but we were able to work on, you know, other projects at that same time. I don't know the city attorney cost. We drafted the ordinance, but then um, our city attorney, of course, reworked it and put in all the legal eagle talk. And um, so I don't know what that cost was. And our mailing was pretty minimal. We, we pretty much do things in-house. In um, so I wouldn't say it was, was a, a whole lot. <clears throat> 
For us in staff time, I would say over the course of a year and a half, maybe um, like 15 to 50 percent, um, one full-time staff person with um, 50 more during the time of just a lot of outreach and going out to the businesses. I think the mailing was pretty minimal. Also, it was um, about three, yeah, two postcard mailers and one envelope mailer that went out to about 300 businesses. Hi, thank you. Two quick questions. Um, several of you mentioned that you had your chambers of commerce in support of your guys' ban. I was wondering, for my usage, the specific names, that way I can hopefully get them in support of our state ban. We're looking at contacting them. And then the second question was um, the price comparison. I think, Jennifer, you'd mentioned that you looked online and found, do you have anything, one, on your website, or two, actually specific numbers of the cost differentials that you guys found that you said maybe brought to your um, council member saying, hey, yeah, it is going to cost more, but it's X amount. Those are my two questions. Thanks. Um, yeah, to address the cost question, so the first one I think was a little bit less accurate. We looked for online prices, and I think those we just found out were really inflated um, compared to what was locally available. And that was really specific. I mean, I went to the three stores that all of our food providers go to, so I can share that information with you um, later. We saw that it was a little bit bigger in the box category and like the cup category, it was pretty small. So we can talk after. I think it's really tricky with the cost. And that's why we didn't like to put out a lot of numbers, but everyone wants to know that. So we could say, you know, pennies more per container because it really depends on the product and the quantities being ordered. So it's really tricky to, to put those prices and I think it can um, scare some people in businesses. Um, Angela from the city of Monterey. I just wanted to make two points. Uh, uh, Shelly, you, you mentioned that you banned uh, polystyrene as well. So we kind of did an opposite thing in Monterey when we banned, uh, we banned polystyrene is we said we only recycle one through five, which is a little weird. We were really after sixes that we didn't want. And it came in very handy to say that because at Fisherman's Wharf, I hope no one's here from Fisherman's Wharf, <laughs> but uh, they were giving out these little chowder cups that wind up in the ocean and it just drives us stark raving mad. So because we banned the six, they have to start going to a compostable because I think the one through fives were a bit expensive. So it came in handy for that regard. So if people are considering it, seven is a little bit strange because there's some compostables that are seven, so yeah. I won't even get into that part. But the other thing about the biodegradable or compostable issue is that even if you don't have a composting product, I mean, uh, process in your cities, at least consider it because the way we addressed it is we said we didn't want it to remain in our landfills anymore. So we just said ban it and then it, at least it'll go away if you choose that product and also that it will set us up for when we do have a composting program. So just as an, an addition for some of the cities going forward on that. Um, we had the same perspective on that because we don't, unfortunately, have food scrap collection at the curbside, but we highly encourage backyard composting. So we have the same situation and yet we banned both types of polystyrene. Similar. Yeah. We have a question here in front. Um, I was just wondering, I think um, Shelly was the only one that's, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, Shelly was the only one who mentioned um, banning those products from events as well, and I was wondering if anyone else was considering um, that, or maybe Shelly can talk about it a little more, or how was your outreach to events? Um, Did you guys wanna? You um, special events were also included in Fremont, and luckily the largest event we have is sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> so as I've said, they're already on board, and, and they kind of control and dictate how their food vendors, who they are and how they participate. And it, it's worth mentioning that in Fremont, we do have a fairly strong residential organics waste collection program that includes food waste and food soiled paper, along with uh, yard trimmings every week. We have some commercial um, organics program, but initially our concern was if, you know, if we, we, when we first discussed this in 2008, the alternatives were likely just to be landfilled by multifamily, by businesses, um, you, you know, to a large degree, half the community that didn't have access to this residential program. And one of the changes that occurred was Fremont's garbage started going to the Altamont landfill as, the, as our Fremont landfill is, is closed, and they have the largest methane recovery system uh, in the world right now. So they're, you know, if, if something wound up in the landfill, we felt less shameful about that because we were gonna have some net benefit from, from that, that material winding up in, in such a landfill. 
In Palo Alto, we had this separate uh, document policy, citywide policy, and it's in that policy that we say that we're not going to have either uh, plastic bags, uh, styrofoam food service, or plastic water bottles. So it's it's in a policy as opposed to the ordinance. Um, for events, the biggest one is the Art and Wine Festival, and that also is chamber-led, and so I think they do a pretty good job. And we did put a clause within the Recreation Department's contract for facility rentals. I can't tell you exactly what's going on. There's events all the time. We're not there. I'm sure it's not a perfect world. <laughs> and we're working on this as well. We have um, some events that happen in the community that kind of um, slips the city radar. So um, yeah, once in a while in the in the past few weeks, I've gone out to events, and it's you know, sponsored by a nonprofit organization that wouldn't have otherwise received the mailing. Um, usually, they're pretty um, sympathetic, and you know, we'll be understanding of that and uh, make sure that for the next time that they'll be in compliance. I also want to add that in Fremont, our school district was impacted. And they, they had a very specific requirement for a five compartment tray. And it was very difficult to find a compostable alternative. And certainly one that was about or slightly more was hard to come across. But the district made a commitment. They went to a compostable tray, uh, found a vendor, and just a, slightly increased the cost of of their lunches through their lunch program and, and they made it work. So they were impacted by it. They stepped up and came through. Okay, okay we have time for one more quick question. Can we follow up? <laughs> uh, sure, go ahead. How is the school district uh, covered under the local ordinance? Institutions? They just wanted the love. They just wanted to be, <laughs> they just wanted to be part of it. So, yeah, we. Um, you know, the, the assumption was this was a change that we wanted throughout the, the community. And if, if the city, if, if our division would have been approached to bridge the gap in cost, we might have looked for grants. We might have found a way to do that because they're, you know, one of our largest waste generators. They make up about 2% of our, our total waste stream. And we would have helped them put this in place if they hadn't done so voluntarily. Well, we're out of time for our panel, so thank them very much for sharing the information. And I'm sure they'll be available after with more follow-up questions.